Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So this one might seem a little bit out of left field, but hopefully it'll become clear. The philosophy of building a house. And um, I've participated in this. I'll speak of this in a moment in a lot of ways. But mostly what I think happens is when people want to build a house, which I think is great. I'll talk about that as well. But um, there's a lot of YouTube content on, you know, how to pour a foundation, how to build a house, you know, every step of the way. And it's great content. And so it's no criticism of that content, but I think it misses a lot of the elements of uh, sort of the philosophical, of course, this is my bias, uh, uh, that that supports and carries the weight of why people want to build a house. And then hopefully to help get a philosophical reflection that helps us understand why it's often so stressful. It's often considered one, considered one of the most stressful things that people can do. And people really struggle with the process when they do this. And so something that in theory should be this joy and this wonderful opportunity uh, ends up being, you know, famously uh, divisive for couples and a nightmare for individuals. And right. So it's this big problem and vexation that comes along with it. And I and I want to reflect on those aspects of it, which I've rarely or if I don't even know if I've ever seen any video content or really read anything that clarifies what I think are some of the philosophical principles that underline the process of building a house, why we want to build houses, what we're trying to accomplish, how do we express ourselves in that process, <clears throat> and some ways of thinking about and understanding the process so that maybe, hopefully, in theory, we can avoid some of the emotional, intellectual, and psychological pitfalls and have a, a, a much better experience and, so, and maybe a, a better outcome as well. So if you've ever thought about this or considered it or are in the process of it, hopefully this would provide some clarity. And I also think it should for people who aren't interested in doing this, um, will maybe give a framework for thinking about some of the big issues that uh, building a house is just a, a part of, which I think is often missed. So not technical content in the sense of like, oh, here's how to, you know, drive a screw, which is something you can find like essential craftsman. If you're interested, look up the essential craftsman. That guy has a whole detailed series on an entire house build. It's incredible. You know, you can learn so much from that. But this is sort of the philosophical, psychological approach. Um, it may seem odd that I would tackle this subject, but I can tell you that if you're going to be a part-time professor living in a remote place, um, working, you know, eight months a year, you're going to have to have some other sources of income. Um, and one that's often in demand is construction. And so throughout my life, even when I was young, growing up on farms and dairies all the way to as an adult, I've worked construction, built houses, helped people build houses, built my own house. I'm in the process of um, moving to France and I'm selling my house. And so that part of what spurred me to think about this in detail because I built the house you know, many years ago. And so this whole process and cycle, I've had a lot of bizarre or, or not bizarre, I guess a lot of intimate experience um, and so over a long period of time. So I'm in no way an expert uh, on any of this from the technical side, but you know, I can build things and have, and I've even had a, con you know, contractor's license, which in Washington state is no big achievement by the way, but you know, th this is a, a lot of experience and in reflecting on people's uh, ex uh, encounters with this process, it's, I've got a whole list, whole notebook of things to ponder and think about. And so I really want to give a philosophical overview and look at what I think are some of the big thinking errors that are made and some of the pitfalls, again, that, that can hopefully be avoided. And this will be in three parts. One is what happens when you approach a, just a traditional build, which is with a contractor and a bank. And then what happens when you try to do uh, owner builder, which is great. And then the final one is what happens when you just go full hippie mode and say, hey, I'm going to do like an earth ship off grid, no banks, no contractors, no permits, all that kind of stuff, right? They're slightly, they're always related, but they're just slightly different processes. And I think each one has things that are worth reflecting on. So first, uh, it, it's hugely important to think about the value, the ethos that is invoked when one decides to build one's own shelter. One of the most, you know, this is very basic. I mean, our primate relatives build shelters. You know, our, our, for, for millennia, our ancestors, our cultures have all had to solve this problem of this foundational need to build shelter. So I think there is something very powerful 
uh, drive that many people have, not everyone, but a lot of people have this drive to say, hey, I don't want to just inhabit a place. I don't want to just, you know, uh, buy it. I want to actually participate in the creation of this shelter. And that is the incredible power and drive that, you know, makes the millions and millions of domiciles that, that populate the world possible. And I, and I think it's great. I think it's a very human, very real, very powerful motivation. And I think it's uh, just admirable when people set about to do this because it's also, you know, quite difficult and challenging. Uh, one of the pitfalls, I think, and this is number one of many, uh, is that for most people, this will be the most difficult, most complex, largest project they're likely to undertake. Because we do, usually aren't involved in trying to manage and oversee you know, literally a hundred or hundreds of people with budgets that are much larger than we're often used to, unless you run a company, right? You probably haven't done anything quite like this. And it's also a mix of sort of finance and real world limitations. And so there's all these sequence of challenges that we're rarely sort of prepared for, um, which doesn't mean don't do it. It just means that I think it can come as quite a shock to people when you go, oh, wow, look at how many steps there are and the complexities on, in so many different places. And so that's one to co consider that this is just a very different kind of undertaking. And one aspect of the difference is building a house, particularly a custom home, is like this vestigial holdover from the Middle Ages. So we're used to thinking about industrial processes where you take in a controlled environment and you have all these people who do one very small job or maybe a lot of robots increasingly. And then they take care of everything and it's all done very much in a timely fashion and it's, in, it's controlled. The material inputs are controlled. The outputs are controlled. It's all very tight and very focused and very specific. And uh, building a house is nothing like that. A house is built in the way that houses were built in many instances, basically for thousands of years, uh, you have a subset of guilds, the trades, that are brought on site serially, one after another after another, and they do a very specific set of jobs. Um, and then they maybe come back, like electrical will come out one time, and then they'll come out a second time, or you know, plumbing will come out one time, and then they'll come back a second time. And so you have this strange sort of medieval process, but we're in a world where we've been trained to think of industrial things. So I order something on Amazon. This is all very well thought out and organized and whatever, two or three days later, it's supposed to be on my doorstep. When we look at a process like building a house, we think, okay, here's a calendar. I have a schedule. I have, you know, all this, this is, this is not um, this is a, a very poor mindset to bring to the process. And I'll just give you know, one example. I'll go through more as I get more into detail. But if you think about how many trades are brought onto a building site, uh, let's just say there's 20 different subcontractors, contractors, all this that are brought onto a building site to do this. Most of these are going to be small companies or, or even individual workers or you know, like a family business or something. And they're going to have weddings and divorces and graduations and illnesses and that you know when you have 20 serially when one of them goes awry in some way just because of life this is this can easily throw off the entire production because oh this is delayed two weeks oh well that's going to delay the next thing too oh then you can't do this and then and you go and so what happens is when we have this industrial mindset we imagine like oh i have this calendar get this sort of abstraction this abstract division of time and people say, oh, this takes so long and that takes so long. And sometimes it will and sometimes it won't. Sometimes the people will be available, but sometimes they won't. And it's this much, uh, If you, again, if you read anything from the Middle Ages about how things happened, it happens like this. But we come with this industrial mindset that we're just so used to. The, the closest analogy I can come to is when you're at the airport and everybody knows that the plane loading times are a lie, right? You, the chances of your plane taking off when it says your plane are going to take off, very small. Maybe occasionally this happens, but, you know, basically everyone's like, okay, it's, you know, within 20 minutes, we're lucky. If it takes off within an hour, you're like, okay, that's good too, unless you have a connection on the other side, right? And, and, and yet, once that time gets put up, it's going to board at 734, if it's 7.35 and they aren't boarding, 
everybody starts to get agitated. So on one level, we know that this is sort of a um, aspirational dream of when they would like the plane to board. Um, but we tend not to be able to adjust our expectations accordingly because we're so trained to the watch. And this, by the way, is a cultural artifact. Um, the, the classic example is duels used to be held at sunrise because you knew when sunrise was. Otherwise, it was difficult to know what, when, what time to meet people because well, you don't have clocks, right? And so it's like, well, when's noon? Well, yeah, maybe height of summer is kind of, well, it's pretty straightened up and down. But otherwise, you know, it's, it's tricky. But sunrise, you got a pretty, you got a pretty good idea when sunrise is. It's going to be, you know, within an hour or so. And that was close enough. Or, you know, the famous examples is, you know, uh, carriage schedules used to be like by the day. Oh, the carriage would come and stop on Wednesday. And if you wanted to go someplace, you were there on Wednesday and you would get on. And it's this sort of sense, different sense of time, very different sense of time. And so we have what is essentially this holdover from the guild medieval construction building system into a modern world in which our expectations are uh, just to the minute, right? To the hour, to the day. And, and, and when that variation, which is inevitable, occurs in, in these really complex problems, we get frustrated because, oh, my plane was supposed to board at 734. And even if we say, oh, 735 uh, is okay. And even if we know this is sort of not really the time it's going to happen, we still, you know, you can see people's uh, tension and agitation start to rise. So one thing to keep in mind if, if you're pondering this is that you're entering a quasi-medieval, not entirely medieval, but you're entering a quasi-medieval process, which is part of the greatness of it. All these skilled craftsmen with their subsets of capacities and all this being brought together to do something, but it also runs very much more like a medieval process than like a factory process. And this is why every year they announce that some company has solved this and like, oh, now we're going to build houses and factories. This never works. I mean, we have mobile homes, which, eh, we have, you know, some of this, everyone, everyone's always trying to crack this because they're like, oh, this is silly. Modern capitalism thinks it's silly to do things like it's the Middle Ages. But it turns out that for things like houses, so far, at least, no one's really cracked this. The closest they've come is the sort of unfortunate um, subdivision where 100 or 200 or 500 of the exact same house is built. <clears throat> and this just allows uh, the, the scale to sort of work. But yeah, usually when people want to custom build houses and they want to build their own house, they don't want to do that. But no one tends to tell us when you decide not to do that factory or, or cl cl uh, factory adjacent approach, industrialization approach, what are you left with? But by logic, you're left with some different system. But that different system tends to really frustrate us because we're not used to the medieval. If we were in the medieval world, we wouldn't worry about it because we'd be used to it. We're in the modern world. We think, oh, this is a factory. This is on time. This is going to click, click, click. This is just a perfect process. Everybody's done it. I see houses everywhere. We must know how to do this in this super efficient way. And it turns out uh, we don't, particularly for uh, custom houses. So that's one to think of is that we have this disconnect between our expectation and our industrialization and our sense of time and productivity and the actual process of building a, a custom unique home. The second thing I think that's it always is this one is once I realized this several years ago, many years ago, it, it the, I noticed it everywhere and now it cracks me up. And so you can play a game with people if, you, if you're thinking about doing this or you want to uh, or you know people who are going to do this, you can listen for this. It's hilarious to me now. Um, but also terrifying, uh, which is the notion that if you go, oh, you want to build a house, right? Okay, that's great. Gonna cut, you know, what's it like? What are you thinking of? Not invariably, but very often you'll get something like, oh, you know, it's going to have you know, this big kitchen. It's going to have some bedrooms and it's going to have a bathroom and, you know, it's going to have so many square feet. And it's like, ah, right? Almost without exception, I can think of one exception, but almost without exception, the people who are saying this, have a bathroom, they have a kitchen, they have a bedroom, they have some square footage. So what they're, artic what they're articulating what they have um, 
which is weird because like why would you go through all the effort and expense and struggle to build something that's that you have you have a kitchen you have a bedroom you have a bathroom why, why are you building that again you have this you're, you're already there what they mean to say <laughs> but they don't really know how to articulate it which is the terrifying part is that the space that they inhabit now in some ways is unpleasing to them is insufficiently something they have a dream they have a vision they want to build their own because they want to make better for them i don't think better in you know some of the absolute sense that we're trying to build the platonically pure dwelling i don't think people are thinking that but they're like oh you know i have some dream i have some sensibility i have some uh desire that's not being met by my current dwelling and i want to achieve that and that because you have a bedroom and you have a bathroom and you have a kitchen, generally speaking, what, don't talk about that, right? Like the question that you want to ask, and this is one of these uh, exercises that I have people do anyway in all kinds of subjects because I love this exercise. But what people are probably trying to achieve, I think invariably, I'm just going to hedge my bets, but let's just forget hedging. I'm just going to say, no, what people want is they want a different emotional content to the space. They want to feel differently in the space they inhabit. They want it to be probably more beautiful, however they conceptualize that. They want in some way to live differently than they're currently living, and they're hoping that a new house, a new space, a space custom designed for them will help them achieve that. And so rather than think about bathrooms and bedrooms and kitchens, and which are all important, right? We're gonna, we'll get around to that, that kind of stuff. Um, I think it's better to ask yourself, and this is an exercise that I love to give people, uh, you know, what is it you want? What is the emotional feel you would like your house to have? Would you like it to be, you know, serene? Would you like it to be airy? Would you like it to be uh, uh, invigorating, right? Would you like it to be a party house? Like you want it to be festive, you know? And if you think of the emotions that you would like a house to evoke, this is a very much different thing than going, oh, I want a kitchen, right? Or I want a bigger kitchen or I want a big kitchen, right? Like th those sorts of, they're concrete, but in an unhelpful way. Like it's like, oh no, people, if you think about something like people often like, oh, we love the Japanese architecture. But what, they, what they're really saying is <clears throat> there's a sense of serenity and order uh, that seems appealing. I think mostly this is what people are going for. And so if you say, not I want a new house, but you say, I want a serene house, this is, this is a, a very different kind of concept. Or if I want a house that's inspirational, I want a house that inspires me. I want it to be so beautiful and so powerful that when I wake up in it, I just feel great. Or I want a house that's a sanctuary. I go out in the world, there's the hurly-burly, the, and I want a sanctuary. I want a sense of being safe and comforted. I want a cozy house. Um, see, and a cozy house is very different from maybe a light, airy house, which is very different from a house that's serene or a house that is inspiration. So this, or like, what is the emotional content? Of course, there doesn't have to be just one, but you probably want an overall one. What's the primary emotion that you're trying to achieve? And then ask yourself, like, what how do you want to live in the house, right? Do you want to be on your, on your own? Do you want to have people around? Do you want to have 10 people around? Do you want to have six kids? Do you want to have, you know, what, what uses do you see in the house? So for, for the 20 years plus I've lived in my house, I've loved, loved the house, which changed almost would change one thing in the 20 years we've lived here, which was sort of incidental and was in the original plan. We took it out, turned out should have stayed. But the one frustration I had, which was a compromise I made in the original plan, was the kitchen was not connected to the garden. We have a big garden. And I was like, oh, I've always like, that was a compromise. I'm like, I probably shouldn't have made that compromise. Like, I should have kept the kitchen connected to the garden because I just think there's something beautiful about that. That connection that the food comes in and out and, you know, you grow in the garden. It's right there. You bring it up. Makes it very easy. That's totally trivial, but a big deal. But as a pattern of living, like being connected to the outdoors. So it might be like, oh, I'm living in the city. I want a sanctuary. I want to be cut off from the outside world. This is a very different house than saying, oh, I, I want to live in the countryside and I want something that's open to the outside world. 
right? These are neither of these are better or worse, but they're very different ways of thinking about how you want to live. And so when people talk about the houses they want to build or the spaces they want to inhabit, rarely do they talk about sort of these emotional use case uh, life patterns. They generally talk about the the sort of more concrete but unhelpful elements that already that that basically they already have right like again don't tell me about your kitchen i know you have a kitchen tell me about you know these emotional or intellectual or inspirational or use cases like oh i'm gonna have a better kitchen what's better oh, i want to have a kitchen where i can bake you know pizzas or something like okay great because i always want to have big parties in my kitchen so i want a party kitchen wonderful kitchen you can live in a friend of mine is living in a place that has this kitchen that is so home like you just walk in that kitchen you never want to leave and everybody just you go over there you just go into that kitchen and it's a kitchen made to live in the kitchen it's magnificent it means not expensive or over the top or anything it's just the proportions the space everything is built for people to just stay there have wine have dinners sit and chat around the kitchen table you never leave it's warm it's comfortable light is great and you're like wow i just want to inhabit this space this is a very different sort of kitchen than a kitchen where, oh, you know, we cook there, we do everything there, and then you take it out into a dining room or like, or there's a big open space so that everything just sort of flows out. I'm always very suspicious of these open plan kitchens because I don't think it gives you that sense of, of comfort and cozy and space, but, you know, different, different strokes for different people. But it's a, just a totally different way of conceptualizing a kitchen and a kitchen space, sort of more of a classic French kitchen. Um, and stuff like French country kitchen, where you're going to inhabit it, have a fireplace in it or something like that. And so thinking about, you know, use case and emotional content um, and material goods, which is often weird. Like, so if you have a particular material possession or set of possessions, often related to use case that you love, like that can really impact like design, like is your custom house or so design it for your like, you know, maybe you have a art collection that you want to show. You need walls, not windows, right? Like this is a problem. Like a lot of modern houses have a lot of windows. They don't have a lot of walls. If you don't have a lot of walls, you don't have a lot of space for art. So light is good, but wall space gets lost. So if you want a lot of art, you need a lot of wall space or some way of dealing with that. Or maybe you have a piano. I read a book about a, a, a lady who later on returned to studying the piano and she bought a grand piano, but she had, I think if I remember correctly, something essentially like a cabin or a sort of house cabin in Montana that was heated by a wood stove. Like this is the worst environment for a grand piano one can imagine. And so she had to do all this, like she had to remodel basically her whole front of her house so that she could have a space for the grand piano, uh, which is, which is a great idea. But you know, if you can think about those and say, oh, what do I really want to do? How do I really want to use my space? What, what is my actual life pattern? What things do I like? What people do I want around? How do I want to spend my time when I'm in this space? And how do I want to feel? These are the kind of questions that can really uh, help clarify when you have to face the infinite number of decisions, which we're about to talk about as you go through this process. Now, if you go with a traditional bank contractor, you know, build, here's how it kind of works out. So that stuff that I've talked about is relevant to everything. So you have to, you know, have some concept of not just how many square feet I want a kitchen, I want some windows, right? Sure, of course. But, you know, that sort of emotional use case flow life pattern questions. This is what architects are for. We'll get to architects in a second. Um, but I want to ponder the process that you go through when you have a, a, a bank and a contractor, the standard sort of normal, quote unquote, build. I mean, once you're into custom house building, you're in the, a strange land anyway. But the sort of more traditional approach to this, and it has some some challenges. And, and one of them being the uh, infinite number of decisions that you have to make. But it is a different set of challenges from when you decide to be your own contractor related. And then, like I said, the final uh, episode will be on when you decide that, you know, no, I'm just going to go full, build my own place, super hippie, forget codes, forget banks, forget all that stuff. It's great. So traditional banking contractor things. Uh, one, and this is to start with the architect. Oh, and in all these cases, like when I talk about banking, talk about contractors, talk about architects, talk about subs, they're good. Right. I'm just assuming that they're good. Now, everybody can get a bad one and that can be its own nightmare and people, this does happen. But 
you know, just to conceptualize, I'm just imagining that they're, they're good at their jobs. They're good at what they're doing and nothing like nightmarish is going to happen or has happened. And, and you still see this set of problems, like bad things happen in every field, right? There's bad surgeons, there's bad everything. So setting aside the problems associated with that, these are just the structural issues that you will face that I rarely hear people talk about. So one is what does an architect do? So architecture can be thought of as the most important art form because it is a, it's built, we inhabit it and it patterns our lives. It's visual, it's tactile, it's every, I mean, it's every art all together at the same time. And it's big. And again, it, it patterns how we live. It, it, it shapes our experience of the world to a remarkable degree. And I think it's often underappreciated what a great and powerful and potentially uh, impressive and amazing art form architecture is. And in theory, what a good architect is for is to help you translate your emotional, intellectual, psychological goals and desires into a physical built space and to help you articulate those goals and desires so that they can be um, brought into reality. Because we have this imaginary vision, uh, usually loosely articulated, loosely, and then and then we need someone to help us translate that into the physical world. And that a good architect's goal is to make your dream, your vision, your emotions, your possibilities buildable. And that's a huge jump. Um, if, if, if you, and we've all made mistakes where we've, had, we've imagined something, then we try to execute it. And then of course, this is just doesn't work very well. Now you're trying to imagine and execute something on an incredibly complex, amazing scale, and you need help. And an architect is that help. And I know architects are often expensive, 10, you know, five to 15% of the cost of a, of a project. And this is often what is the range that is given, but you know, your, your mileage may vary depending. And it, so it's an easy one to go, Oh, you know, there's plans in magazines, there are plans in books there. We can kind of just, you know, move a wall around all this, but a good architect is uh, just invaluable because, you know, things like light and how light affects us and sound and how sound affects us. And they can also save you a lot of money um, on a project uh, in, in, because if, if you, it's easy to waste money doing unnecessary and unhelpful because people th think you should have it or, or it seems like a good idea or it can be poorly executed. And so while they, you know, they can cost money, which is a constraint, um, they can also save a, a significant amount of money. But most importantly, a good architect will help you uh, realize your dream in, in a way that you probably couldn't articulate yourself and certainly do not have the skills, uh, the normal person, average person just does not have the skills to understand the complexity that goes into it. Um, one example I really like is, you know, contractors, builders want to measure everything from the outside of the building in, but you don't experience space from the exterior of the building. You experience space from the interior of the building. And a, a proportion and ratio really matter. I mean, oh my God, these are so important. But if you measure everything from the exterior of the building, because interior walls are a different thickness than exterior walls and all these variables, you lose a lot of proportionality because you're not working from the, the experienced out, experience the felt out. You're work, working from the arbitrary measure in. And there's a reason contractors want to do this, which we'll talk about in a second. But for the living in, you want inside out in a lot of ways. And so that is just one, I mean, one tiny example of the importance of this light studies where they'll go through and say, here's how the sun is going to fall in your building with these windows 365 days a year. How, where do you want the sun to be? How do you want to experience light? you know, these sorts of things. Um, or, or one example from my own house is the architect that we work with. Hello, Alex. Thank you very much. 20 years of joy. Um, he pointed out that in the Pacific Northwest where we don't get a lot of sunlight, but it is overcast a lot. And on overcast days, the light comes equally from all direction. It's specular light because it's all refracted in the clouds and mist. And so you want windows 
on all sides of your house. You would think in a place that doesn't get a lot of sun, you'd want a lot of windows towards the sun. And there are a lot of houses here built that way. And it's wrong. And they're very dark because we have so many rainy days that they're cutting off, you know, 75% of the light they could be getting because they're all the, the, all the windows are on one side and that side is going to get 25% of the light or whatever of that day. Whereas if they had windows on all sides, what you then get is you get the really bright interiors because you're getting 100% of the available light. And that's just, when he explained this to me and showed it to me, I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And yet almost all the houses in our area do not work this way. And every time I go in, I'm like, oh, I've been doing this for now for decades. I'm like, oh, Alex, genius. Very. So that's just a subtle, simple, but profound and on the lived experience of our space and your space, these sorts of subtle differences can make a huge impact. And so your architect is sort of your companion in trying to help you articulate and realize in the real physical material world, the intellectual, psychological, emotional life pattern desires that you have. And the clearer you can be about that, the more likely they are to be articulated, the less frustrated you are to be about the process. So then you go to the bank. Now, it's important to note that the bank is giving you money. And so what the bank wants from you is to build a house that if you foreclose and don't complete it or something happens, they can complete it and not lose money. This is their goal. So everything at the bank that's giving you the money is set up for them not to lose money on the house, which means they want you to build a house that looks like every other house that's ever been built because on average, those houses sell. And so their goal in this process is very different from your goal. On one hand, they're helping you get the money to make this possible. So that's good. On the other hand, <laughs> they're trying to protect themselves. And the more you vary from the basic template that they have of what a house should be, the less happy they get, the more usually money they want from you, like as a down payment, as a percentage or whatever, and the more difficulty they give you. This is sort of just as a rule of thumb. And it's not because the bank is bad or evil. Easy to think that. And if you've had experience building a house with a bank, you may think they're bad and evil. But it's because their fundamental concept is like, okay, if we give this person four hundred dollars or $500,000, or $700,000, I mean, houses are so expensive now, it's just ridiculous, say $700,000, we want to make sure we can sell it for $700,000 if worse comes to worse. And if they decide they're going to build a stainless steel box with a swimming pool and a saltwater fish tank and no kitchen, that's hard to sell for $700,000 or dollars so we can get our money back, right? And so they're like, no, no, no. We know what sells. We have all these comps. And, and, and again, it's just a simple tension. It's a simple and inevitable tension. They are going to always press in the way they inspect and the way they want the paperwork done and the way they give valuation and the way they cut checks as you go through the building process. They're going to continually ask, it's just in their DNA, am I likely to get the money back from this that I'm putting into this? Or am I going to be in a situation where we're going to lose money? And they never want to be in a situation perfectly reasonably where they're going to lose money so they're pressing all the time on trying to make sure you're building something that will be acceptable to the market, which is just some abstract random average buyer. So one big place I think people run into tensions when they start trying to build a, a custom house is they immediately, as soon as they start talking to the bank and start looking at the paperwork, they immediately start getting pushback uh, on certain elements that may be unique. You think they're great. The bank says, no, this is crazy. And, and here we go. And then this architects of course should be able to help you negotiate this or at least flag it for you. They'll often say, Hey, you can do that, but you know, here we go. Trouble with bank. Um, and of course the more money you have, the more flexibility you have because the less money you need from a bank, but assuming you're going to need a fair chunk, then you have to do some fair negotiations with them. Uh, and that, I think, is really the one thing I wish I had understood better when we were building our house because it, it came up several times. And finally, you just realize, like, oh, this is what's happening. 
Now, the third big player here, besides you, maybe an architect, I, I think of the architect as being on your team. So a good architect is on your team. So it's you and your architect, maybe, or just you with your dream. And you have the bank providing the funding, or at least a good portion of the funding. Then you have the contractor. And it's important to understand what how a contractor looks at this and how they think about it, um, because it can also be another big source of tension. And so uh, unless you're, you know, spending huge amounts, of, even then, it doesn't, I don't even think the amount of money matters that much, actually. But if you spend huge amounts of money, then at some point you're just basically own the contractor. But most contractors are smallish businessmen. I mean, they may be successful contractors or making good money, but they need to build you know, two, maybe three houses a year um, if we're doing custom construction to sort of to, to keep their business rolling, right? Because if one project falls through, they need to have another one on the line. And so what's helpful for you is they really want to finish the project in a timely, efficient, and, and cost-effective manner because that's how they make money. So their goal is like, okay, I have amount of time, and in that time, I need to get this house finished. And the contractor in most places, the United States, and I'm talking mostly about the United States, other countries, I'm not sure about their variability, but in the United States, the contractor will also sign a contract with the bank. So they'll have a contract with you to build this house, and they'll have a contract with the bank to build the house. So they're actually serving two masters here. And the contract with the bank is like, oh yeah, I am going to build this house for this amount of money, and it will look like this, and I have to do that, or else... You know, I get in trouble and they won't pay for it. And now we're all, all, all in, a, in a world of hurt and, and a contract with you to build the house as well. So they're often double. They have two different contracts that they have to meet. And for them, because time, quote unquote, is famously, uh, you know, cost them money. They want to do it efficiently. So they keep looking at everything through this lens of I need to build so many houses of such a value over a certain period of time or else. I either lose money or I go out of business and that's no fun. They don't want to lose money or go out of business, which is perfectly reasonable. And so everything they look at is coming through the window of completability. I think, I don't know if that's, if that's a real world word, but that, that they can efficiently have some sense that they can complete this. And what they have that sense of is what they already know how to do. So contractors tend to be very happy when they're doing things they know how to do. They tend to get really unhappy when they're asked to do systems or processes or use materials or uh, have anything that they don't know how to do or that they're not that experienced with because now they're like, oh, I don't really know how long that's going to take and I don't really know how much that's going to cost. So what I have to do is build in a big buffer. But they also know that sometimes if you build in too many big buffers, then the client's not going to choose you and then they're not going to get the job and then they have to go get another client, right? And so they're, they're like, ah, ooh, ah, okay, yeah, you want a actual project that I was working on. You want 28-degree uh, cantilevered walls and a 22-foot poured concrete interior masonry structure. Nah, like, okay, both of those are weird and outside the norm, and they don't know how exactly, like, okay, that's not that hard, okay, it's not that complex, you know, and so you just, but any time you start moving out of just what they're comfortable with, and different contractors will have different levels of comfort with the different processes, they will always try and get you to go to processes they're familiar with and comfortable with, and that they know, for instance, that permit centers are familiar and comfortable with, and they know the banks are familiar and comfortable with. And so your dream, your emotion, what you want um, is not bounded by which are often arbitrary, but often not arbitrary, but often arbitrary just conveniences and, and, and processes that are familiar and so, again, you run into this friction, this, this, this tension. And it's not from ill will. It's not from the contractor trying to be a bad person or the bank being evil. It's from the fact that they have a, a different eyes. They have, they have different experiences. They have a different view of the world. And they're like, oh, 
if we do uh, 16 foot interior ceilings, well, this requires a different kind of truss system. And I don't know how to do that truss system. Or, you know, we don't usually do that truss system. I don't know if my current crew is really that great at that truss system. And, you know, and, you know, tickety tick right down the line. And, and so there's a whole series of concerns. And, you know, so they'll either say, oh, well, hey, you could do this. This would be cheaper. And so this is why when you see a house that's been built by a contractor, by the way, this is why uh, when you get those. 500 house developments, they all seem sort of sterile and similar is because, yeah, those, those developments grow out of convenience for being built rather than vision of loveliness, excellence, beauty, or, you know, excitement, inspiration, art, whatever it was that would be driven by a particular vision of a particular person, which is again, why I think it's such a wonderful concept for you to build your own house because it creates this uniqueness, this new vision, this new way of thinking about space. But Again, it's a new way of thinking about space that's going to run into this resistance. And again, not because these people are evil, but because the contractor and or the bank is sitting there going, if we pull, if the permit center comes out and the inspector looks at this, are they going to ever, even if it's, I've, I've seen this, houses that have totally legal, completely code um, right, correct uh, features, that the permit center just never sees. And so they immediately flag it and say, we can't give you a permit. And it's like, well, no, this is, and then you have this back and forth that can take weeks until a permit center will go, oh, okay, yeah, that's totally fine. So no error was made. The, the, the thing as designed or as built was correct and to code, but it just delayed and created this havoc and nerve and anxiety for a month, uh, weeks, even a few days just because it was unusual, just because it was new, because it was novel. And when what your contractor is like, oh God, no, this is terrible. Like this is the worst possible thing because now I can't work, you know? And, and this is where, when I talked about before, all of the subs that have to come onto a place, one after another, after another, the contractor is responsible for that. And so he's going, oh, this weird feature that they're going to come out and inspect, and I don't know if they're going to improve it. Oh, they didn't improve it. All right, so now I've got to call everybody and say, hey, uh, you have to back off for three days because we've got to fight with the permit center. And they're like, hey, I got, I'm going to start this other job, but the other job is going to take two weeks. So don't call me for two weeks, and then I'll come and do this. And they're like, great. So even if I get the permit center to move in 48 hours, it doesn't create a 48 hour delay. It creates a two week delay. And then of course, domino effect and everything is down and now the bank's not going to cut a check and you know, but Hey, presto, we're behind schedule instantaneously. And then you look for ways to catch up and you know, this is just the process. And so the, the uh, contractor is constantly, good contractor is constantly trying to smooth. It's constantly trying to look forward and say, okay, where are the potential problems? What, and so when they look at plans, when they get you sit down with you and your architect and they go, wow, their, their, their mind is just looking at this like efficiency, like, oh, that's going to be tricky to build. That's going to be expensive to do that. I don't know about that. Like that, wow, are you sure you really want that? That seems unusual, right? Or, or the, whatever language they use. And so then you begin this negotiation and it can be very frustrating because it's easy for the person with the vision, even if you have a good architect backing you up, to feel like, oh, there's this all these forces pushing against that. And the reason for that is there are all these forces pushing against that. And so this is why where I started from, which is this notion of having a very clear sense of what it is you're trying to achieve is so vital. You're not trying to build a house. That's stupid. You have a place to live already. You're trying to build this vision of yours, of something of beauty or something of, again, inspiration or serenity or musical or whatever it is that's your unique vision. And if you can keep that in mind, then it's easy to go, oh, like here's a trade-off that's worth making because yeah, I can see where that could be a pain in the ass and it really doesn't contribute to the serenity. Or you can say, no, like if that's not there, there is no serenity. Like there's... That, 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 that will remove the serenity that I'm shooting for. So this is not, a, this is a non-negotiable element. We can maybe figure out a different way to do it, but we have to have it. And if you think of the, your sort of your core baselines, then it makes it much simpler. And, and this is vital because not only is the bank going to push back against anything and the contractor going to push back. And again, not because they're bad, just because of, they have a different 
outlook on this. But then you're going to face one million, it's just an infinite number of decisions. Uh, it's, it's just shocking to me, the, the range and number of questions that can be asked. Now, you can offload a lot of this if, you know, there's, all, there's sliders on this. You can just say, okay, look, here's the plan, architect, just take care of it, fight with the builder and get this done. And then it becomes the architect's problem. This is a more expensive deployment of the architect because there's a lot more time for them. Or you can tell the builder, like, this is the plan, this is what's in there, do what's in there. Um, and you can make the builder responsible for this, but, you know, then you're putting a lot of the responsibility and decisions on them. Or you can take a lot on yourself and say, no, I'm going to really monitor this process. And, you know, certain elements are, are very important to me. But just for the sake of this lecture, I looked this up because it's very simple. And I just say, you're probably going to have a front door. That's a standard feature. Now, if you go to Home Depot, this is what the architect, or not the architect, this is what the contractor probably wants. And the bank is perfectly happy if you do this. You go, okay, I want a front door. Well, you, there's front doors at Home Depot that are you know, perfectly reasonable, nice, decent. Like it, it's a front door. It will function for $400. Okay. There's also front doors at Home Depot that are $2,000. So that's a 5X range. And we're just at Home Depot. This is totally standard, non-custom, just Totally dead, just dead standard. 5x. So you can spend five times more <clears throat> doing the same functional thing. Functionally, it's a front door that lets you in and out. But the impact, of course, is going to be totally different. Now, if you think custom, <clears throat> like, oh, I want a custom size or I want a custom, I want an arch. I worked on a project where we put in an arched front door. And I think the final cost was $16,000 <clears> because we, you know, we had leaded glass windows and we, you know, had to arch the entryway. So we had to cut a cut, cut an arch into the entryway. And it's sort of this beautiful medieval custom made him, right? So go from 400 to four to 2000 to 16,000. No problem, right? This is no problem. You can spend there. There is basically, there's no amount you, you can spend as much as you want, right? There's no limit to what can be done. And you go, right, so I have to make a decision about what front door I want. How important is the front door to me? How does it relate to everything else? And if you don't have a clear guiding set of principles and you make a lot of decisions on paper, it will drive you insane. Like, it, because it doesn't end. There's no, like, so you have a front door. It's like, okay, now you just decide, I want to splash out for a front door. I want to make it, you know, a little fancy, a little nicer. I saw this custom one, got a good deal on it. Maybe it's 2,500. Okay, great. Um, and then you go, Oh, you want a handle? Oh, yeah, I need a handle. All right, so now you have, here's, you know, you can have hand-hammered brass poured by, you know, uh, monks in the Alps, right? Or you can go to Home Depot and get one for whatever, $20, right? And so then, then you go, okay, okay, fine. okay, now I've got a door handle. I've got a beautiful door. I've got a beautiful door handle. It's like, oh, hinges, like hinges, right? Hinges, right? I'm going to need hinges, right? Okay, now do you get hinges that are embossed with dragonfly, right? And then they go, okay, now I've got hinges and I've got a door handle and I've got a door. It's like, oh, threshold. You need a threshold for the door. <laughs> you know, it's just like at some point, like, okay, if someone kill me, right? Because I can't make all of these decisions. It's, it's, it can, it's easy for many people. Some people love this, by the way. Um, but for many people, it's easy to get overwhelmed because you, it's, you, you don't know, like, what should I, should I buy? If I spend more on every single thing in the house, then of course, the house will go shoot wildly over budget. Um, but is it okay to just buy box standard? And does that do what I wanted to do? What is it I'm trying to do? And this constant need to refresh and to rethink and to reflect and to go, okay, what am I trying to accomplish? And how does this individual thing actually relate to it? And so it is this sort of intense microcosm of the ethics of life, which is why I think it's such a philosophical question, because we, we tend to avoid asking these questions. We try to answer them once and then just go with a pattern, which is great. It makes life livable. And what building a house does is forces you to stop and question sort of everything all the things you don't question now like you don't want to think about a door handle you don't want to think about a threshold you don't want to think about hinges unless they break we tend to go like i don't want to think about hinges like how many times a day did you think about hinges probably not unless you have a broken hinge but all of a sudden i've got to stop and think about hinges or I have to decide I'm not going to think about hinges, but then I know that somebody else is thinking about my hinges in a project that's supposed to be mine. 
and that can drive you mad too. So there's like, ah, so the tensions come at you really fast and very powerfully. Um, and, and often it's, this is the core. Uh, it's easy for people to go, oh, it's the money. And the money is certainly stressful because, you know, budgets, of course, famously go over and, you know, delays cost money and, you know, the, you want the nicer fixture or you get this great idea halfway through the build and you're like, oh, okay, it's going to be right. All of that happens. But I, I do know people that have built a house and essentially money was not an object. It was, it was actually, it was, and, and they almost got a divorce from doing this until they finally just say, hey, we just have to take a break. Like we're, we're building our dream. We've always wanted to do this. We're fortunate to be in this position to be able to do it. And they, they had to just walk away and leave for like a couple of weeks because they're like, we're going insane. But it wasn't money pressure. It was the pressure of this infinite number of decisions. Uh, but the money is, of course, a constraint, and that just adds to it. But even when it's not a constraint, it can, it, 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 there's so much tension that can seep in if you aren't clear and don't have a through line and don't have values that you can return to again and again and again because you're going to be answering these kinds of weird questions continuously for months and for an indeterminate amount of time, which is also part of the not fun. Again, back to the fact this is a medieval process, not a modern factory industrial process. And so you find yourself going, okay, I have a vision. I have a dream that I want to incarnate in the world, which is amazing. It's like writing a novel or making a movie or, you know, learning to play the Sonata or whatever it is. Like, this isn't a great and, and, and an achievement that I want people to be encouraged to pursue. Um, but we tend to be ill-equipped for it. And when we enter into this and you go, oh, I need to manage a project, the key things that need to be managed, again, is your vision and yourself because you're, you, you or, or if you're a couple or a family, like you're responsible for holding that vision. And if you have an architect, then the architect should be your friend who's helping you manifest and hold that vision as it becomes real in the physical world. And the only way that can happen is if you have real clarity about not about the square footage or the budget or the number of bedrooms, which is all fine, but about those other elements, the elements that are going to make it yours. And when I've talked to people in this process, what I see sapping them that seems to be like drawing the life out of them is that they feel like, oh, the dream is slipping away because the bank said, yeah, we're really not going to pay for that. And like, oh, the budget's kind of been blown. And the contractors are like, hey, we can do this, but it's going to cause a long delay. It would be better to do this. And they just feel like the, the, the thousand little cuts that slowly kill them because they can't see or feel the dream coming to life, but they do see and feel it sort of being, you know, this just wearing grinding process. And it's hard to know which trade-off is the one that's going to kill the dream and which is the trade-off that actually you're never going to think about again as long as you live and you're just totally, completely happy uh, with the outcome. And, and to end on a happy note, by the way, it turns out that most people, when they finish, like giving birth to a child, all the, the difficult, struggly part goes away and they're amazed at sort of what they've achieved. And it sort of exceeds their expectations. Because again, it is one thing to have a vision. It's another thing to be able to physically incarnate it and inhabit it and go, oh my gosh, like we made this thing or we participated in the making of this thing. And now it's here. And now I can see how all of these ideas and thoughts and emotions and, and, and uh, desires have been made real. And just that is an extraordinarily satisfying achievement, right? Even if it did not like come out perfectly or something was a little wrong or you had to make compromises, they realize that you could achieve something so amazing and so big that so much of your vision could come through, that so much of the dream could be realized and made incarnate in the real physical world tends to be in itself just a great, like just great 
Um, and I think that's often overlooked. And so it, it's probably going to turn out much better than you think. Certainly when you're in the process, I would say on average, that's true for people. So the philosophical, again, to get back to the philosophical is if you keep in mind that you're entering into a process that's probably bigger and more complex than you're used to, unless you have a very big complex job and you're bringing an industrialized mindset to a medieval process. So this is all already going to create problems for you. And you're going to deal with forces, the, the bank and a contractor and financial constraints that feel like they're working against your dream. And often they are working against your dream. Let's be totally honest. They often are, but they don't mean to. It's not from malice. It's from the fact that the way they view your project is very different from the way you view your project. Um, and that their constraints are different from your constraints. And so you need to keep that in mind and go, okay, I am the defender of the vision. I am the one who's bringing the, the, the desire and the design and the life to this project. And if builders had, were architects who could also build, they would do that, but they, they're not and they can't. It's, it's you, it's your ethos. And basically I'm, you know, I'm always bringing everything back to ethics. So let's just land, land there. Cause it's basically you're bringing your ethics to life. And that process means you have to explore your ethical foundations or the more you do, probably the better this process will go for you. And you have to kind of hold on to them or vary them as the circumstances seem to dictate. And as your own reflection and your own thoughts change and grow in the process, by the way, which is absolutely going to happen, where you start is not where you're going to end up because you're going to grow and change and, and, and reflect and become a deeper understanding of yourself and your desires and your visions as you go, as you should. And so it is this real profound ethical a reflection that I tend to think it's just almost never mentioned because we talk about, you know, how many square feet, how much concrete, how many windows, what size windows, what color are the walls, all of these things, which, which have to happen because those, that's the process of building, but that's what contractors are for. This is what code people are for. This is what, you know, cement contractors are for, but the purpose and the goal of you is probably to incarnate, incarnate a dream. And so this clarity of the dream, not number of rooms, not height of ceilings, not the floors, whatever it is, the clarity of the dream that will make it buildable and beautiful and yours much more than all of the how to material and ways to save money and cut costs and all of that, which may be important and may be necessary to get a project to completion but they only make sense and are only valuable within the context that you bring to them. And to me, I see this as, I think, where people really break down because it's easy to get sucked into the vortex of what the bank wants, the contractor wants, and the, and the problem of the medieval construction system and lose track very quickly of like why you're doing it, what you're trying to achieve, and that tension. You go, oh, I know something is wrong but I can't quite articulate it because of all of these outside forces that are overwhelming me. So that would be my, if I give suggestions, I don't really like to give a suggestion, but reflect um, and, and create a good sense of who you are and what you want and what your dreams and desires are. And if you can come up with that core list and continually return to that, then you have a metric on which to make decisions and decide which decisions aren't even worth worrying about and which decisions are really core. And then you can throw away 90% of the problems because they aren't, they don't really matter. And you can focus on the ones that do. And this, this in and of itself is a huge relief because then you can sleep well knowing like, yes, I've addressed the ones that are core because I know the ones that are core. Because otherwise every one of these little teeny tiny problems feels like it's the biggest problem in the world. Because you think, oh, if I mess up my light switches, then I'm loot, like the whole project just becomes pointless. Or if I mess up where a door goes, then somehow, and maybe the door is the most important part. That's the door. Um, but, but maybe not, right? Probably not. So when you think about building a house, part one, uh, keep in mind this 
significant importance of your vision and holding it against the forces that will push back and try to shape and try to mold. And the clearer you are on that, the greater you'll have the opportunity for you, for the process to go smoothly and for you to come through with something that you're very, very happy with. Next time, I want to talk about what it means to be your owner builder, which is where you take on the role of the contractor. Um, again, I think it's a great idea, something to think about, but it's, uh, I've seen a lot of people do this, and wow, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding on what contractors do. And as you can imagine what I've just said, you almost create a sort of internal tension in yourself. So now you're not fighting with a contractor, you're fighting with you because these are two very different jobs. Anyway, I know that's very different from what I usually do. I hope this was helpful uh, to someone and thank you for listening.